Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Music Den. I am your host, Armando Venditti, hoping you guys are having a great Friday. In this episode of the Music Den, we are going to be doing New Music Discovery, George Jackson, Part 4, the final installment of this wonderful series that I know you all are watching. I have with me today the one and only Mr. Bill Schuster. How are you doing, Bill? Doing well, Armando. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is, as I said, part four of our uh, look at Joe Jackson, and part of, um, as I call it, New Music Discovery series, I guess you call it. It does sound pretentious when I say that. Anyways, um, we are going to be covering two albums from uh, later on in his career. We're going to be covering um, Night and Day 2 from 2000. There you go. And the second album is the Joe Jackson Band, Volume 4, from 2003. There you go. Uh, Night and Day 2 is released on Sony Classics, and Volume 4 was released on Rykodisc originally. So, without further ado, I will hand it over to Mr. Bill Schuster here to give us a bit of background on these albums. Take it away, Bill. All right. Thank you, Armando. Uh, the reason I chose these two particular albums to close out the series is because Joe had just come through this period of uh, experimentation and lots of left turns and interesting creative choices. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So these albums were back to back after odd albums like night music heaven and hell and symphony one he decided to put out a sequel to his most commercially successful album night and day apparently it wasn't originally planned to be a sequel it just became that along the way he realized he was making songs about new york again uh, there are a couple of return appearances here you got sue hijopolis on a sort of percussion and the ever-present Graham maybe on bass, who were both big parts of the original Night and Day album. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Volume 4 is the first uh, reappearance of the original Joe Jackson band, who last appeared on this colorful item here right above my hand, Beat Crazy, in 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I found it interesting that after all this experimentation that he would go back to his two most popular periods in one form or another. And I, I've over the years asked myself, was he trying to sell out? Was he trying to relive his former glories? Was he trying to prove something to critics or longtime fans? Mm -hmm. Um, in the end, I think it, I've generally come to the conclusion he was still just doing whatever the hell he wanted. <laughs> and this was just what struck him at the moment. It sounded like fun. So why not? Apparently, he already had half the songs written for volume four before he decided, you know what? Let's just do a full on album reunion with the original band. Why not yeah. just have fun with it? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I'll, I'm curious to hear what you think uh, regarding those questions I was asking about his intentions and do these live up to the previous works? Um, well, I got to tell you, um, I kind of look at, and I'm going to get my notes here, guys, because I'm old. I need my notes. There you go. Um, you know, not as old as Bill, but I'm old. You know what I mean? So, I mean, there you go. We only and neither of us are as old as Joe. There you go. There you go. Bill knows I'm joking. Before you guys send me comments about, oh, you so he knows I'm joking. He knows I love him dearly. So, um, I'm only a hundred. It's okay. There you go. There you go. And I'm ninety eight. There you go. Um, okay. Um, what do I feel? What do I feel about night and day? Uh, two. Hmm. To me, obviously, the songs on on this album. Um, Reflect, you know, stories of people in New York City, um, modern day, right? And, you know, we're, we're talking X amount of years later on. I, to me, this is a fantastic, 
it's almost like a concept album you know um it it deals with people stories from people that living in the inner city right um there's there's an underlying theme a day in the life is a theme uh from different people and it touches on all walks of life from your you know average pardon the expression joe in the street to someone who you know people from the you know lgbtq to s plus community to um you know, um, the tra um, the track with Mary Ann Faithful on, on vocals. Uh, to someone who, to I call it almost like a, um, I was going to say debutante, like someone of of a higher stature. Like, you know, like you know, like later on in her life, looking back on her on her relationships and her regrets and her, you know, her wants and her feelings. You know. Um, I'll just go through the track listing. First of all, guys, you need to get, if you don't have this album, get your hot little hands on a copy of this SOB. I swear to God, it is fantastic. Um, it starts with Prelude. And, you know, he uses a lot of cello and, and uh, orchestral instruments on this album. And he's got almost like, there's like a, a rhythm using almost like a hi-hat uh, beat going on and it kind of underpins the entire album you can hear it throughout the uh when it segues from track to track um and it prelude is just an, is the instrumental featuring great cello uh hell of a town it's it's a very rhythmic track very um, i call it a good ass shaker of a track you know what i mean very um stranger than you um again great use of cello uh kind of the, the use of cello kind of underpins the entire piece of music uh, for the for track three. Uh, it's very melodic um, and good use of the string quartet on this on this piece. Um, track four is why and no, not the Annie Lennox track. No, <laughs> yeah. no, nope. totally different, totally different. And um, uh, Bill's dogs agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, featuring vocals from Susan uh, Dehim or Dehim, sorry, uh, beautiful sure. vocal. <laughs> yeah, no, she does some beautiful vocal phrasing, and again, uh, fantastic chords uh, on the cello. Um, Glamour and pain comes next, track five, guys, and it's basically what I take it to be. Is a day in the life of someone, you know, from the gay community who basically entered into a relationship with someone who was on the DL, on the down low. And he wants to keep his relationship with this individual quiet. And this individual doesn't want to take it anymore. Fantastic vocal from um, Dale, De, I think it's DeVere, DeVere. I've always said Devere, but I'm Devere. not. Yeah, Devere. Sorry, Dale Devere, uh, who is an actual you know, local a drag queen in New York City. Um, fantastic vocal from him. Very relaxed feel. Great. Again, the cello is all over this this bloody album. Uh, very. Um, the melody for me. Um, th there's a section of the of the track where it's very reminiscent of. Night and Day from 82. Like he there's a lot of references back to Night and Day. Either like in in, in terms of the instrumentation, um uh, from you know, uh there's an a fantastic um instrumental break that comes up. Um very melodic and and, and it just ends with some notes on the piano, very soft notes on the piano. Um it's like Dear Mom is like Gut wrenching, okay. Um, my, my notes say a sad tale set to a beautiful melody, and it's basically someone saying that you know, um, his mother sent him on on a, a trip to New York City 
to find his sister, 16 years old. And when he finds her, he just she basically tells it tells him, tell mom to go to hell. You know what I mean? Like, we're done. I'm not coming back. And then he turns around and says, you know what, mom? I'm staying here too. <laughs> like, I'm not coming back home, right? Um, it's a beautiful track. It's very gut-wrenching, very heartwarming, very poignant track. Um, oh, God. And it, it's beautiful. Um, track seven is the one I was trying to remember with Marianne Faithful on lead vocals. Love Got Lost. Um, again, wonderful cello, beautiful mel uh, melody, nice violin, uh, reminiscent again of, oh, Jesus Christ. We were talking about the Beatles last week when we stopped taping. This is very reminiscent of She's Leaving Home from Sgt. Pepper, this track. There are certain notes, certain chords that are played. It's just like, <clears throat> I'm. it's gut-wrenching. <laughs> You know, like I'm listening to this and I'm almost like crying because it's so beautiful and it's sad. You know, it's really sad. And my notes here, a woman reflecting on uh, the lost, uh, her lost chances in life, you know. Um, beautiful uh, soprano vocal that comes in at one point. Very dramatic piano chords that come in. That He, he, he has a tendency to do a lot of a lot of piano stabs. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like really definite on the on the piano on the keyboard. Um, just because is next, and again, um, great and uh, great use of violin on this track. And uh, you know, there's a this track he uses. They they twin the uh, violin and cello when they do when they do their lines together. Just fantastic. Um, what else do I have here for this track? Um, oh my God. A, okay. I have here a harsh look at one's experience in New York city. You know what I mean? The, the, this guy is just pissed off about his experiences in life. And it's, it's, it's quite bang on actually. I mean, we all go through these experiences, but it's very dramatic. Uh, and I like the fact that you also, they do some, I call it dueling cello and violin lines musically, right? It's like, you know, I can do these better than you can kind of a thing. <laughs> you know, um, Happy Land uh, talks about the, talks about an arson that, that happened at the Happy Land Club in New York City in 1990. And uh, it's very sad, uh, very dramatic in terms of the piano use on this, um, but also very rhythmic because it goes, you know, a lot of Latin rhythms on this track too. Track 10, um, Stay, beautiful piano on this. Chords are very reminiscent of Stepping Out. That is the one direct linkage to night and day one, like stepping out, right? I mean, I'm listening to him like, holy shit, he's gonna, it's gonna, he's gonna segue into, you know, either he's gonna sample himself or he's gonna go into stepping out. Um, yeah, fantastic, fantastic track. Um, you know, um, bloody hell um and that's that's it that's the my take on this album it is a fantastic look at oneself in terms of of the human experience right because it's the human experience ladies and gentlemen it's messy it's loud it's abrasive it's heartwarming it's gut-wrenching it's human you know and this album personifies that wholeheartedly and if you can get yourselves a copy get yourselves a copy i swear to god you will, if you haven't heard it before you can stream it on youtube it is not that hard to find you will not be disappointed and that's my take on it 
Very nice. <clears throat> Not winded, but yeah. Hey. <laughs> All right, let's, there's a couple of things I'm out here. Before I forget, uh, the string quartet that appears on this album is a group called Ethel. Yeah. And five years later, Ethel did a tour with Joe and Todd Rundgren, where they each had their own separate sets for each, all three, and then they came together at the end. Yeah, I'm going to get so that. If anybody's season. interested, this is uh, quite quite a unique live document it's got two cds and a dvd of the whole show so okay and ladies and gentlemen you can get that on uh, amazon oh yeah 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 Yeah, as far as i know there are still plenty available um yeah 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 Yeah, definitely point out the the cover now here we go special effects my cd cover will be the same size as my album cover which is right next to <laughs> of the original night and day there you go there you go uh, yeah a little closer i don't know how well you can see here in the rearview mirror in this new york taxi cab which is that's joe himself in an actual yeah. new taxi cab and in the background uh is the world trade center the twin towers which came down the next year of course so yeah yeah definitely so yeah yeah, an interesting, yeah. yeah, just an interesting footnote there, I thought. Yeah, no, um, very, very interesting. You were talking about the drums. I wanted to point out with the drums, oddly enough, other than Sue doing percussion on four tracks, yeah, uh, there's only one track with real drums. Gary Burke drums on Love Got Lost, of all things. I would have assumed it would have been one of the more upbeat tracks that had the real drummer, but no, the rest is... Uh, Joe doing drum programming. Yeah. And he also does uh, some synth bass on there too. Graham only plays real bass on three tracks. So okay. yeah, Joe's doing a lot of the the uh, heavy lifting with his uh, sorted keyboards and electronic devices. Yeah. Um, I have often uh, gone back and forth over the years since this came out, whether I like this better than the original night and day mm -hmm. and I'm still i don't have a conclusive answer i i find them both very satisfying it's very reminiscent of the original uh i can hear the callbacks to the original like you said the stepping out chords there are appear more than once in the album yeah it's just in little hints it's like his little He's he's just tossing a little bone to the fans there's hey remember this this is what he's we're acknowledging doing. the past yeah yeah uh, to me, the sonically, this is a bit like the original Night and Day mixed with, say, Heaven and Hell. If those two uh, had a child, it would be Night and Day too. I think. Um, That's a good and uh, good analysis of it. Yeah, good good comparison. Yeah, I agree. Um, the bit about uh, glamour and pain and Dale Devere. Uh, to this day, I still don't know the truth. But there's much speculation over the years that uh, Dale Devere is actually Joe Jackson's drag identity. And that Joe is having a, a bit of fun with the fans and being very coy about it, and not quite revealing whether he is actually Dale Devere. In Get out of here! Yeah, I mean, look, see if you can, I tried to do some research, and I don't know, I could see it based on this picture, I could see uh, that being Joe in drag, but I... I don't know, a biscuit! There is no definitive answer that I can find yet, though, but that's been speculated for a long time. If you look at uh, the 25th anniversary special, which was the tour for this album, basically... Uh, Glamour and Pain is not sung by Dale DeVere or Joe Jackson. It's sung by Allison Cornell, violinist and keyboardist and vocalist. Uh, and Joe made some reference to, you know, we had a drag queen sing it on the album. So we're going to uh, pull a twist and have our drag king, Allison Cornell, sing it here. So... If he was Dale DeVere on the album, he didn't give it away in the live performance by scene. No, no. So 
I don't know. I'd really like to know. Oh, so that's a, a mystery to explore if you're interested in that. Uh, oh my god, you know, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um Oh my god. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um I'll say these these uh songs, yeah, they there are a number of them that uh are very emotional, very touching, as you said, and yeah. Yeah, glamour and pain in particular. Dear mom, yes, love got lost, and yeah, happy land always gets me. Just the, uh, uh, it's just so musically well done, but it's the story, the way he, uh, the way Joe sings it. His vocal is is just powerful, and when she goes back into the club, they all thought she was loca for you know going back in, that she was still just. Who cares? You know, Bailamo. I, I don't know. I need to look up. Bailamo, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Bailare. Spanish-speaking folks are uh, probably shaking their heads at us right now. But that's... Yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. But you know what? Fantastic. Um, yeah. It, it's emotional. It is gut-wrenching for me that to to hear it but i mean it is a fantastic album overall i i in closing for this one i look at it as a whole a cohesive piece i don't look at it as separate uh single tracks right um i agree and, and i believe that this album when it was released only hit the uh, made it to the charts um the dutch charts it didn't yeah it didn't, it didn't hit so much at all. It didn't go well over in the U.S. or in Canada, or which I'm very surprised. I am so surprised. But again, I think Joe Jackson, again at this point, he wasn't concerned about hits per se. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it'd be good to have him, but he, you know, um, he never. Um, was concerned about that. I should also point out, I forgot to mention that this album was released on October the 24th of 2000, again through Sony uh, Classical. And uh, we must carry on, ladies and gentlemen. The second disc in this final installment of New Music Discovery, George Jackson Part 4, is the George Jackson Band Volume 4. Ta da! Um, Released. <laughs> there you go. That's a double. That's a double disc version, is it? Obviously, it's okay. a uh, a bonus uh, six song live. Session. Yeah, that's it was right. the uh, the original band doing new live performances of six of their classic songs. Rough. Okay, that's right. That's right. I write about that. Um, I believe first release for Ryko Disc released on March 10th, 2003, produced by Joe Jackson. Um, this was the first album with the original Joe Jackson band since um, 1980. Yeah. yeah. Beat Crazy. Beat Crazy. Sorry. Uh, from. Yeah. 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 So. Um, I was reading up, I'll just I'll, I'll let you finish, but I was reading up that he wasn't, George Jackson wasn't totally convinced about doing this um, this reunion because he really didn't see there was much point to it unless they could do something, more, I guess, um, not rehash the past, but sort of kind of continue from where they left off. And he also you know, also said very tongue firmly planted in cheek that he still had a 32 waist. Yeah. So that, you know, it wasn't some older gentleman over bloated, you know, with a waist so big, he, you know, had trouble moving around on stage. He could still move on stage and he still had a 32 inch waist. So, you know, I will let you take over. As to what you have, as to what you know about this album, take it away, Bill. <laughs> uh, as far as introductions go, I think between the two of us, we've covered most of the 
the basics with this. Uh, uh, of course, Graham on base, uh, there were periods where he wasn't around, but for the most part, though, you can find Graham maybe sprinkled throughout most of Joe's career. So, yeah, it wasn't really a reunion with Graham. Um, let's see here. Oh, that's never mind. <laughs> I thought okay. I had something else there. Okay, that's uh, fine. Thing after this, just a little side note. Okay. After they played out the whole volume four and original band uh, in the tour and the album, uh, five years after this, his next album, Rain, featured three quarters of the original band. They ditched Gary Sanford and his guitar and concentrated more on being of a, a sort of a jazz pop trio and emphasized Joe's piano more. So it's that evolution. Throughout. Okay, well, yeah. let's see what happens if we subtract this and add this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's got to be said. I mean, Joe's piano is all over the all over these albums, no matter what. You know, um, just quickly before I get into my shtick. Um, <laughs> Was were there any singles released from uh, Volume Four? Supposedly, "Awkward Age" was released as a single. But I certainly never heard okay. anything of this album on the radio. Yeah, okay. that was a good choice. "Awkward Age" is a good song, but yeah, I had no clue it was ever released as a single at the time. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I will endeavor to give you my views on Volume Four. Uh, again, released March 10th of 2003 on Microdisc. Um, for me, this album, the tracks on the album have a real pop sensibility. Um, and they try and capture the energy from Be Crazy. You know what I mean? Like from those first few albums, uh, from Look Sharp and I'm the Man and, you know, um, good album, good album. Um Take it like a man takes, you know, is the first track. Again, um, you're gonna hear how can I put this? You're gonna hear the words hooky <laughs> on this album, very hooky, okay? Uh, these tracks do fall in within the the parameters of a three to four minute pop song. Uh with Take It Like a Man, it has a nice salsa style piano to it. Um Still Alive is track two. Uh, again, nice hook to it. Here we go with the hooks. Uh, pop, a very there are a lot of pop elements to it. To me, it sounds like the birds. The guitar on it sounds like the birds. Um, you know the chords on it. It just it just reminds me of, you know, to everything turn turn turn. You know what I mean? It's just it sounds you know. Um, Awkward Age is track three again. Very hooky. A song about teenage, it could be a song about teenage angst. You know what I mean? It just has that feel to it. Um, let's see. Uh, Chrome is next. What do I have here on my notes? Um, nice tempo, good guitar, good bass on it. Love at first light. Guys, if you're watching, and I know you are, do not ever ever say to your girlfriend or your wife that I loved you at first light. That is a surefire way to get your ass kicked and the door locked behind you. Um, this track, basically, he's saying to his girlfriend, uh, this woman, that I don't know who you are. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sitting here looking at you. We had fun the night before. We went crazy, really crazy, but I don't know who you are. And it's not until you smile at me that I realize, oh, I know who you are. It's like, don't ever say that to any, <laughs> to any significant other or one that you want to be your significant other. Um, and in my notes, a, a hilarious take on a Friday night um, mistake on Saturday morning. Oh, that's yeah. that's what I put, right? That's that's basically what it, what it is, right? 
Uh, fairy dust. Take from that what you will in terms of the uh, uh, song title. Um, my notes, funky guitar, really funky guitar, nice piano solo. There's a nice extended guitar section, uh, extended, sorry, instrumental section on this. A um, little bit stupid. This track seven, good rhythm. I call I what I hear is great fuzz rhythm guitar on it. Very melodic, good organ solo. Uh, nice reference to sweet. I hear references to sweet. You know, uh, ballroom blitz. You know, you know who guys. You know who sweet is, right? Um, that that is my impression. Uh, next track, track eight, blue flame. Nice melody. Nice miss, uh, mid tempo um, uh, pace for me is what I hear. Good melodic chords on the piano. Um, again, uh, for me, the melody on this track is very reminiscent of if you guys know, uh, obviously, Johnny Mitchell. If you know the song Amelia from um, Johnny Mitchell from Hygiera from 76. This track to me is very reminiscent of Amelia. Uh, the guitar chords on this, the, the the melody of it is so beautiful. And if you want, please check out Johnny Mitchell's Hygiera, like amazing album. Um, Dirty Martini, uh, track nine. What are my notes here? Nice rhythm. The organ pa um, section reminds me of Ele uh, Elvis. Elvis Costello's Pump It Up right very sort of it has that kind of that feel to it uh oh my god number 10 thugs or us okay a hilarious you know what it's a hilarious track um where do i have here catchy melody taking the piss out of the out of the thug culture you know you know, yo, homeboy, that kind of feel, right? You know what I mean? All done to a ska beat. Okay, so I mean, it's it's quite funny. It's quite funny. Um, um, track eleven. Um, uh, last track. Um, hmm. Fast. Um, my notes say here: fast paced track, good bass, great guitar. Um, has it has a new wave sensibility to it for me. You know, um, although the track, the subject matter is quite serious. You know, it's about uh, two people in what would be some would deem it as an abusive relationship. You know what I mean? Like uh, more so on the emotional side, maybe not so much the physical side, but more so on the emotional side. Um, but yeah, those that's my take. I like this album. Um, I can see where he was trying to go with this album, you know. Uh, I think he's trying to go to back back to his like roots with you know what he did with Be Crazy and maybe a bit of I'm the Man and Look Sharp, right? Because the songs are very immediate, you know. Get on, get on stage, do your bit, get the hell off, go have a drink at the bar, kind of a thing, right? Like that. That's my kind. That's my take on it. So, and I'm sticking yeah. to it. <laughs> how would you, uh, how would you rate this compared to any of the first three Joe Jackson uh, band albums? Uh, in terms of like one, I don't. I mean, out of ten, yeah. But do you think this stands up to any of those albums, better or worse, or? Um. I think it's it's. I don't know how can I put this. How can I? Put, I think he attempted to capture what he did. I think on some stuff he 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 succeeds. Um, I think on other songs, uh, maybe like you know, "Dogs Are Us." I think maybe it's just a bit too corny, you know, what I mean? <laughs> but it's still good. So I think this is just. And you know, like a half step behind the other, you know, the earlier albums, like the first three albums, you know. 
But I'm new, right? I'm a virgin when it comes to Joe Jackson in terms of knowing knowing his stuff and getting used to it. So which is yeah, that's why I'm I'm particularly curious because you're hearing um you're hearing albums that are decades apart all at once, as opposed to me who uh yeah was so familiar with those earlier albums for you know 20, 20 years basically before over 20 years before this came out. So uh yeah it's interesting to hear that take to me this was uh I think there's a certain amount of burnout with those early albums and I think I said on the first the first episode in the series here that that early stuff like look sharp kind of feels like sketches kind of like an artist just trying to learn who he is and mm -hmm. and he kind of became much more colorful and interesting later, even though I love those early albums. To me, they they're I like this better. And I know I'm in the minority on that from all the reviews I've read and articles and stuff online, all the research I've done on these over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, to me, though, I think the band, they're, they're better musicians in yeah. 2003 than they were yeah. Back in 79 and 80. Mm -hmm. And Joe's a better songwriter, I think. He's he's had a lot more experience. And obviously he's written a wide variety of things that are quite a bit different than this. But it seems yeah. effortless how he can just go back to this. And as you said, throw out all these hooky, hooky songs here. It, yeah, they are. This is very different from Night and Day Tube. And very deliberately, obviously. Yeah, so. but that that just shows his um, his diversity, his ability to show diversity. Um, you know, you asking about grading this album just quickly. If I was to grade, I give it an A minus. Yeah, that's pretty strong. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, like, uh, wanted to point out awkward age you're talking about teenage angst um dig into the lyrics a bit and see that he's also talking about himself even being his older self still experiencing yeah. that same angst still being uncomfortable at parties and still not fitting in okay you know? which uh so i i always really like that about that song that uh it's him relating to this awkward teenager still <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i get that i get that um there's still that uh, awkward teenager inside myself too that i absolutely uh yeah i still don't feel comfortable at parties either so yeah really? right there with you joe and really? you too okay. beauty queen <laughs> um yeah. and the the uh love at first light you were talking about uh Talking about uh, being a woman, I actually believe, if I remember right, in this period, uh, Joe was in a long-term relationship with a man at this point. So he may have been actually writing some of these lyrics about the guy he was with at that time. Okay. I'm okay. not 100% hey. certain, but... Hey, you know what? It goes both ways. I mean, many a time... You as know, does Joe. Huh? <laughs> many a time... You know, like how many how many times does it happen? You know, when you when you're single and you're dating, and you know, being a dance suite, that you know, the occasional hookup happens, and then you wake up the next morning and you're like, oh lord, I mean, like it's just like, you know, what have I done, right? And you kind of want to chew your arm off to get away from them because they're basically sleeping on your arm or whatever, and you can't move. So I mean. You know, so it's it's like being in the bear trap without the bear kind of a thing. But I mean, you know, so no, I get that. I get okay, that's true. That's fine. That's fair. That's fair. And um we'll make a comment about bright gray also. Uh I I don't know, there's different ways to interpret what he's trying to say with bright gray, but yeah. I don't think it's very clear. One way that I've interpreted it over the years, you know, he's talking about this male-female dichotomy here. And uh, that one, he's very say very clearly saying he and she, and you know, there's no 
ambiguity there at all. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of wondering uh, when we all become uh, this dull black and white should fall away. Tell me it's not just me. Can't wait until we're all bright gray. Is he saying maybe we do away with the idea of gender altogether? That maybe, I don't know. I've, I've thought I, that. I think maybe he's saying that there should there should come a day where we all look at each, look at ourselves and look at each other as equals. Yeah. You know, um, I think that I think that's that's one that's one way to look at. It. I think that's a positive way to look at it. But I think that's yeah. a very strong possibility that that's what he's talking about. Um, but that's the good thing about his music and his lyrics. He, I mean, he leaves certain songs open to interpretation, and you take from it what you will. I mean, in that respect, you reach a, a brighter, a broader, not brighter, as it's sunny here, um, a broader audience in terms of that, in terms of the message you're trying to get across, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's very possible. It's very possible. My question to you, Mr. Schuster, is... How would you rate this album? I don't know if you said this, but how would you, if you were to give it a rating, like I did, um, how would you rate it? Hmm. Oh, wow, it's kind of hard for me to rate. Being such a huge fan, it's hard for me to really rate his albums low. So take this with that in mind that I would probably give this about a nine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's I think in relation to so many others. Uh, yeah. I might even be tempted to go as low as eight point five. I don't, I don't know compared to some of his other albums that hit me a little deeper. There are definitely uh, there are two or three songs on here that yeah are just kind of fun throwaways. They're well done, but. Um, Every song is not a 10 out of 10 here. And there yeah. are certain albums that I would say they pretty much are. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. excellent album. I love it. But, and I, I still stand by. I think it's for me, I get more out of it than any of the first three albums, especially the first two. I think Beat Crazy has the most life left in it for me because it's the most different and off the wall. Yeah. So, yeah, look sharp, and I'm the man. Are both great, but they're kind of basic. Yeah, yeah, they're it, very black and white. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't want to. When I say simple, I don't mean it in a, in a bad way. But I mean like you know, two to three minute pop tunes or new way, you know, pop new way, whatever. Like get on stage, do your bit, get off. That's it, right? Where's the bar? Kind of a thing. It's like it, it's not it. It's not as they're not as deep as the other pieces of other albums that were going to come later. So I was going to say pieces of music, but other albums that came later. Right. Um, well, I mean, for me, if I was to, like, I, you know, if I was to rate these albums, I would give this album an eight, a 7.5 to eight. I would. And if I was to give, um, a rating to night and day two, 11. Wow. <laughs> 11. A plus, 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 all the way out, right off the board. I swear to God, this album, Night and Day Two, is a fantastic album. There's no way around it, and there's no excuses for it. Um, and I'm not just saying it because, you know, um, Bill introduced me to it. I think it is a monster of an album. I think it's a very underrated album. I think it is one of um, a very good concept album. But the concept isn't isn't right in your face. This isn't a wall, right? I mean, this is just a group of songs with an underlying thread all through them that connect different people it's like you're in an apartment building 
and each floor is a track each floor is a song right good analogy right and the camera pa uh, closes in on a window goes into an apartment goes into another song goes into another experience and then when it, it's over camera pulls out goes up to another floor or down to another floor and goes back in again goes in for the close up that's how you look at it that's how i look at it get yourselves a copy of these two albums especially night and day amazon discogs ebay thrift shop do whatever you got to do find it i'm telling you so i'm telling you you will not if, if you're open to different music um genres and a melding, a meshing, sorry, of different music genres. Get the this album and the albums that we mentioned on previous episodes. You won't go wrong. I mean, it, you know, and you can always stream them on YouTube. You know what I mean? So, and just a little footnote: I did get my copy of Heaven and Hell. Okay. No. Would you rate uh, Heaven and Hell higher or lower than Night and Day Two? Oh, Bill, you're making me think on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Why would you do this to me? Um, yeah, I'm not even sure I can answer that, really. I, I, I put them pretty close together. I, yeah, I would say they're they're comparable. They're, I mean, they're they're equal. To me, they're equal. Um, just for the sheer scope of both albums. The sheer scope and the majesty, and I'm not going to use this term lightly, the sheer majesty of Heaven and Hell, with the exception of track six. Track six turned down a little bit before because it just right in the face. It gets you, right? You're you're lulled into a situation, and then track six comes in on Heaven and Hell, and you're like, what the hell is this? You know? So I mean, but they're comparable. They're 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 that good. I I'm sorry I missed it when it first came out. You know? Um, Everybody else did, too. <laughs> yeah. Except for a few of us weird diehards. And, and... Yeah, yeah. And I probably saw it in the record shops, but I didn't pay attention to it. So, so ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this quote-unquote series, New Music Discovery, Joe Jackson. Um, please, down there, down below. Please put your comments. Do you like these albums? Have you heard of these albums? Do you like Joe Jackson? Do you not like Joe Jackson? You know, it's all about discovering new music and giving giving us your thoughts, your viewpoints. Um, and for any of you who thought I was actually going to be playing music on this episode, no. It wasn't going to happen. It was never going to happen. And there's one individual that I'm referring this to that I will not mention, but I digress. Anyway, uh, thank you for helping me with this segment and these segments, Bill. It's been great. It's been great. It's learning. Been a lot of fun. I'm yeah. glad you have, uh, glad you've enjoyed Joe stuff so much. Hopefully you can dig even deeper and hit a lot of the spots that we skipped along the way. Cause there's lots of treasure in there. You know what? You've opened my eyes to a whole new, like a, a new, I mean, I, again, I've known of George Jackson over the years, um, but I lost touch, I think, after um, when, 1991. Uh, after what album did he release in? After and Lust? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, yeah. Because I was released on A&M. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I, I don't think that did very well. Um, I think it was okay, but in terms it had of that, that mm -hmm. Fleetwood Mac Oh Well cover, which drives me crazy to this day, it just stands out like just it, it's a just I love Oh Well, but it didn't need to be on a Joe Jackson album. Okay, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. There's certain songs you don't have to cover, right? Yeah. So, um, guys, thank you for watching. Please again check out these albums and let us know what you think in the comments down below. Uh, um, quick. Uh, Sorry. Uh, sorry. Just just a couple plugs for this is Joe's uh, biography. 
don't get your hopes up if you want to know about his popular music career because it only pretty much goes up to right when the first album was being prepped and released but it's still quite interesting and this uh i just got this a few months ago this is one of those every album every song review books that this gentleman did here uh richard james and if you're interested in just hearing commentary on the whole catalog it's a a fun book it I don't know. I think it's like 20 bucks roughly online. So yeah, you can get you can cool. get that book uh on the songs on Amazon. I saw that and I was gonna get that um myself actually. And I probably I might still do that, you know. Um pay days next week. Anyways, um ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for joining us for this series and a little a quick plug for next week. <laughs> Saturday. September 30th. Mark this down. The and I'm gonna this is what we're gonna title the episode. The ever elusive Pink Floyd album ranking is happening. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. It is happening on Saturday, September 30th. Uh we are taping. It'll be airing on October the first. It'll be myself. Bill Schuster, Andrew Cox, Brian McFadden, and also Peter Kent from the Lizard King channel, and probably Ryan Gavalier. He will be joining um, if he does not have to work, um, or he will be joining late <laughs> into the into the uh, ranking episode. So for that one, again, get yourself some food, get yourself a drink, a coffee, get comfortable clothes, <laughs> get comfortable clothes. A jumper, you know, a hoodie with, you know, and a pillow, because it's going to be a long episode. We're going to be ranking all 15 Pink Floyd albums. Yes, yes, even Endless River. It's happening, finally. So hopefully you guys will join us for that. Again, thank you, Mr. Bill Schuster, for all of your uh, insightful information and your help on this uh I guess uh series we can call it. So that's it for now, guys. Uh please take care of yourselves and one another. And I will we will be seeing you soon. Bill will be seeing dark you side next of the week. Moon. What was that? On the dark side of the moon. Yes, we'll be seeing you on the dark. Good tie-in. We'll be seeing you on the dark side of the moon. Because it'll be dark when we do the episode. It'll be late <laughs> at night. <laughs> so the sun may be up by the time we're done with the episode. Exactly. That's why I'm saying get yourself some comfortable clothes, some good food, preferably comfort food. Okay. No salads and, <laughs> and a pillow to relax with. So for Mr. Bill Schuster, I am Armando Venditti. Hoping, hoping you guys are having a good day, good weekend, and we will see you very soon. Bye for now.